Yeah, Latin American Directions. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and I'm stepping in for Nicholas Sussman, who is the regular host on the show. But I'm delighted to be able to talk to Juan Pablo Tello, who is an old friend through a number of shows that we had over, over the last year or two. So, uh, Juan, it's so nice to talk to you. Welcome to the show. Hi, Jay. It's great to see you again and to be in the show again. Thanks for inviting me. So we're going to talk today about the elections, of course, which is it's kind of a it's a it's a, it's a look through a, a keyhole um, to see all of Latin America and and maybe North America just as well. Um, but before we do that, I want to ask you about the paintings behind you um, because they're very captivating, and I want to know what they are and who did them and how you got them. Uh, well, yeah, this is this is the what I call the flagship of my house. It's a uh... Both paintings were made by an artist in Comuna 3 in Medellin, which is was a neighborhood that was really, really violent back in the 2000s. And with all the changes of the country, it became now a tourist destination. So I was maybe a year, two years ago there, met the artist, saw his work, found it fantastic because nowadays still it's a humble and working class neighborhood full of immigrants. But they decided to change. They decided, they decided to stop being, you know, the the typical thing that everybody understands when they see a poor neighborhood in Latin America and they became a tourist destination. They do culture, they do dances, and then they do this amazing painting. So I just think it's a, it's a symbol of the rehabilitation and change of Colombia. Yeah, we can, we can see part of those paintings and I'm really, I'm really impressed with the art, uh, with the color, the design, the passion, all that. Um, it's beautiful. So anyway, let's, let's get to the subject of uh, the elections. Uh, uh, Nicholas Sussman has done two or three shows on the subject already, and I guess it involves everybody in Colombia. Now, you're a lawyer, you're a business lawyer. At the same time, you, you're very candid and you, um, you see things clearly from a, the point of view of where the country and where Latin America is going. So I really uh, am excited to talk to you about it. So first, give me your general impression on Petco's election. And he's going to step up in a few days. Um, and there will be changes. Uh, there will be changes that some people like and some people hate. So can you talk about how he managed to get elected and what the changes might be? So the first thing we, we have to understand about the political process he had in Colombia is that it's, it's one of patience and of long time. Gustavo Petro has been trying to be president of Colombia since 12 years ago. He represents what people believe is real change. I, I do not believe that. Uh, he got himself elected with a speech selling that Colombia was worse than 20 years before, selling that Colombia is just as Venezuela, that things are dramatically bad, that everything's bad, selling, let's say, a pessimistic uh, perspective of the country. And then if you repeat this message for 12 years and then you check on every single mistake that the passing governments had to take advantage of it. Well, that's mes that message is gonna grow on the people, especially in a country and in, in a place like Latin America that is so unequal. When you have lack of access to opportunities, lack of access to good education, someone's gonna hear this. And then these sort of speeches are really populist. People like them. They promote dramatic change with no basis. If you go and see the programs, they, they are quite nicely written. But then when you go and ask for the funding for doing all, the, all those changes, they simply say the answer is taxes. And tax to the rich, tax to the corporations, tax to everybody. And there's, there's a huge fiscal issue in Colombia. But then again, and going back to answering your question, it's an issue of patience, time, and repeating over and over and over the same I believe lies and misinformation regarding how the country has changed in 20 years until you get elected. Well, we are um, we are in the same place from all my judgment with what what is going on with Trump, what has been going on with Trump and his followers, and it's killing comparison actually. So, what's uh, Gustavo Petro's uh, background? Where where does he come from? Where where did he emerge from on the political scene? So, Gustavo Petro was a former guerrilla member of the M19 guerrilla movement. He went through a priest process. He went through a judicial process. Was he involved paid. in the FARC settlement? 
No, he was not. He was not not at all. He comes from a let's say a northern a northern guerrilla that was originated in Colombia in the eighties, and then they became sort of the standard of guerrilla movement in Colombia because they were an intellectual guerrilla. They were not they were not like the FARC, which were much more Marxist, much more militaristically advanced, let's say, but rather an urban guerrilla that striped for really symbolic hits. One of the most remembered ones that they did was stealing Simon Bolivar's sword from the National Museum and saying that they they claim it for the people of Colombia. So mm. his background comes from that period and from that movement. Does his background I, come from violence? I mean, it has not been proven that he has been involved in direct violent actions yet, I guess. But uh, no, I, I mean, I would be lying if I was if I tell you that he was involved in violent access. That has not been judicially proven. Hence, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot okay. affirm it. How but, about, um, how about sim is he sympathetic to the guerrilla movement, uh, his part of it? Uh, is, is it? This is the kind of thing, perhaps, where the president of the country is actually sympathetic to the guerrilla faction? Is, is this possible? No, 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 no. That's that's a long stretch. Gustavo Petro has has consistently criticized precisely the narco traffic uh, issue in the guerrilla movements. He's he's a rebel, but he went through a process, a judicial process, to be part of the politics in the country almost 25 years ago. Mm. Hence, he has been critic of the violent actions and of the drug dealing mechanisms that the guerrillas in Colombia have. So although he's not sympathetic and not openly fond of them, I do believe there's going to be certain, let's say, coincidences that might help to move forward the new peace process with the ELN and what, whatever remains of the FARC. So uh, who, who actually support him? I, I get the feeling that uh, it's, the, it's people in the rural areas, um, people who are disadvantaged, who, whose education uh, is, not, is, not, um, is not complete. Um, and who are uh, fooled by the misinformation. Is, is this the correct statement of who voted for him? So if you ask me, I think it's a mix, it's a mix of everything. And, and that's what happens in Latin America with whatever political leader gets elected. It doesn't matter if it's from the right, left, center party, it doesn't matter. So you have different kind of voters. The first ones are the ones that vote for him because they, because they have never been represented in the government let's say leftist citizens that have always supported guerrilla movements that have been part of them and that are now integrating into society then you have people from the outskirts of the country if you look at colombia you're going to find highly developed nuclei like medellin bogota bucaramanga barranquilla and then if you drive four or five hours away from them you're going to be in a totally different country in a rural area without access to any basic needs so um, he was particularly uh, a victor in those places in Colombia, especially in the places that used to be guerrilla strongholds. So, I mean, those are just coincidences, right? <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, I, I just, I, I'm an outsider completely, but it strikes me that, um, you know, in the conversations I've had with um, both you and Nicholas Sussman, uh, you know, the FARC settlement was a good thing. Uh, Colombia has been moving in the right direction. It has a, a democracy going on. Um, and I wonder if, if this particular result in this election, this new president is encouraging to you or maybe not. Well, if you ask me, Jay, I'm not too fond of him, to be honest. He's uh, the political candidate that I dreaded the most in the election, mainly because I believe he's a terrible administrator. He was a major of Bogota a couple of years ago when Honestly, there's a few little things to rescue from his administration. It was all about talking and politics and populist uh, ideas that lacked funding, that lacked execution, that did nothing for the city. So my critic for him, my criticism for him comes from there. I do not believe he is the most prepared person nor the ideal person to handle Colombia in the moment as it is. It's been 20 years of advancement. It's been 20 years of changing things. Of changing things, I'm aware we still have a lot of challenges, especially in equality and lack of state presence, precisely in the areas where he got where he got the most votes. 
but uh, that doesn't mean things are, are 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 being done wrong. They have to be corrected. They have to be maintaining certain aspects. But honestly, right now, if if you want my optimistic view, I don't think he might be a threat to democracy in a sense that it's been 25 years since he's been playing the politic the political game in Colombia. One of the things I criticize the most about him is he sells himself as an outsider of the political field in Colombia, and he's not. He's governing with the pre actually right now he's going to govern with traditional parties of Colombia. So if you are going to sell yourself as an anti-corruption candidate and then go and work with all the same parties that have been part of the control of the government for 25 years, then that thing just doesn't make sense to me. So I do not believe he's the real change. I do not believe he's a threat to democracy because ironically, because of the corruption mechanisms that exist in Colombia. But uh, yeah, I'm not his, his, uh, his opponent. Uh, am I right to say Hernandez was his opponent? Um, yes. And his opponent was a, a business person, a businessman, a, a developer, I guess. Uh, um, w w would his opponent opponent been more in line with where the government was, more in line with the direction of the country prior to this election? Was uh, Hernandez somebody who uh, would help build the country and continue the progress of the country more than Pet Petro? Wow, that's a difficult question, Jay, because honestly, I believe this the second round of the presidential ele elections in Colombia were just, we, we, I mean, for an elector like me uh, or as myself, it was just choosing between the worst and the least worst, I guess. Hernandez, for me, was not the best option, clearly. But if you, if you put me in an election where I have to choose between Gustavo Petro, who has radical change ideas regarding how the economy must be run in the country, and a person that doesn't, then I'm going to pick the person that doesn't simply because as I see things is as long as business keep working, as long as Colombians have jobs, as long as we keep opening opportunities as we have done for 20 years, things are going to change eventually. But if you put a rock <laughs> in the path of progress, well, that's what I'm mostly afraid of. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. I hope he does a good government. I, I want the best for my country in the end. I do not share his ideology. I do not share how he wants to run the country. I do not share his speech because I think it's lying to Colombians. Colombia has changed. Colombia is a different country. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's my opinion. My optimistic yeah, yeah. view. Okay. Hernandez so, was an outsider. Well, if I'm in business, um, am, I, am I concerned? about what happens uh, when uh, Petro takes over? Uh, am I, do I, sh should I rush and close my deals right now um, before <laughs> things change? <laughs> what, what would you say to your clientele about that? So the issue, Jay, is I will say it depends. I mean, I'm optimistic. I will tell you it depends on the kind of project you have. If you're just trying to get funding for a big highway project or a big hydroelectric plant, probably would be better to close it now. And I think there's two reasons to do that. The first one is, as we all know, the economy in a macroeconomic level and globally is changing and it's gonna affect Colombia. So it's gonna change the interest rates and most of the people and most of the developers of projects in Colombia acquire their loans in dollars. So if you wait for the economy to get worse, well, that, that's just gonna get more expensive. You So the fastest you close your deal, the better. And the second is, although Mr. Petro and these mechanisms that he governs with can be a guarantee that things are going to be stable in Colombia, it's better to just, you know, close your deals, do it when the economics are working, and don't let anything, you know, open to randomness or to whatever happens in the country. Then again, I don't believe Gustavo Petro is going to be a dictatorial president that's going to change the game in Colombia because he can't and that's not his speech and that's not what he has promoted for 20 years but definitely there's going to be changes in the economic ground that might affect the development of businesses hopefully not that dramatically hopefully not as the how the radical opposition in Colombia wants to sell it that this is going to become Cuba or Venezuela I do not believe that I hope it doesn't happen 
but uh, I think we just have to be careful. And uh, as with any business, you know, just calculate your risks and assess them properly. Mm -hmm. You know, every country has to have a foreign policy. It has to have foreign relations. Uh, countries in Latin America have to be mindful of you know, what's happening to the North in, in Mexico, in the US, maybe Canada. Um, so where, where is um, um, Petro on, on those things? Does, does, does he think beyond the borders of Colombia? Yeah, uh, Gustavo Petro is a person who has recalled the Latin American values all along his political career. And in this election, particularly in, before the first round, he was openly critic of many of the posters of Colombia in its foreign policy. Colombia has been a country that has supported this past 20 years a lot of the liberal agenda of the OECD and has followed, you know, many advice from European countries and the U.S. Colombia is clearly the closest ally of the U.S. in South America. So Gustavo Petro was really has been always really critical of that. But since he got elected, he has moderated his speech. And I believe so because of the mechanisms that he's working, the political mechanisms that got him elected depend in a matter and in a way of that economic structure. So I hope there are not big changes in many things in Colombia. He has moderated his speech dramatically because after the first round, he had to get the voters from the center political spectrum of Colombia and convince him and convince them that he was not going to be Nicolas Maduro in Colombia, right? He wanted to differentiate himself from that, let's say, socialism of the 21st century political agenda. So I think there's going to be changes. The U.S. received his election with calmness, which was something really important for business persons and people that have a political perspective such as mine. So, uh, yeah, he has an agenda. He's planning to integrate with Latin America, which I think it's great. But uh, hopefully he does not leave behind all the good things that we have built in 20 years in the diplomatic scenario. That means good relations with the U.S., great relations with NATO, and great relation with the powerful economies of the continent. Colombia has been one of the powerhouses moving the continent along with Mexico, Chile, and Brazil the past years. And the Pacific Alliance is an example of that. So hopefully he does not leave that behind because it's an instrument that can be and should be used more to get our economy and move it. Well, you know, we've talked about this before. We've talked about, you know, the, the huge benefits that would result if uh, Latin America would stabilize. And it seems to me that uh, over our discussions, Colombia has been relatively stable. Uh, it may not be as stable in the future as it has been over the past couple of decades, but um, still it's a, it's, a, it's a keyhole into the future of Latin America. And to the extent that it is stable, to the extent that it uh, sheds stability on other countries uh, and becomes an economic uh, uh, political leader, um, you know, then that would that would bring uh, Latin America into being a a um, you know cohesive continent, a continent that can do big business around the world with its resources and trade possibilities and all that. Um, but to the extent that um, uh, you know Petro isn't really there for that, I wonder what we can learn about um, the political political events in other countries. For example. Um, Brazil, uh, we talked about Brazil before the show, and, and Brazil is moving to the, the left right now. Uh, is, this, is this a good thing? Is this something that would work in favor of a, um, you know, a consolidated Latin America? Honestly, yay, I don't think so. So um, there's two things that we have to analyze when we see Gustavo Petro's election along with the elections in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro and uh, Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. And is this is the result of inequality and lack of opportunities. Every time people, when the people's hungry, when people lack opportunities, when people do not see a possibility to advance, to progress, to have a better life, a better quality standard, then they are gonna be prone to admit extremist speeches that works for, for leftist and you know, radical right speeches. I mean, Bolsonaro is an example of that, right? But I do believe that if these speeches keep winning in Latin America, 
and they keep with economic programs that just literally bleed out the finances of the countries, then nothing good's gonna come of, out of that, right? And uh, you can see that even in Brazil, you know, in, in the later years of the Partido dos Trabalhadores in Brazil, well, things were not working quite well. Brazil had huge corruption scandals that actually splashed all over Latin America. So I do not believe that Lula winning in Brazil is a good thing. I don't think Petro is ideal candidate for Colombia, although there's a silver lining regarding stability, Jay. And I have to rescue this. And is if a left, a leftist president is elected in Colombia and then he can govern wrong or right, whatever he does, but the country keeps being peaceful, then I think there's a silver lining there for Colombian democracy. Because it would be a proof that his speech that got him elected, that Colombia was a dictatorship of a hundred years of the traditional political class, it's going to be a lie because it is. So if you ask me, I do not believe they are the best option for Latin America. I clearly don't believe it. But if they do it and they govern peacefully and we can change in the next election, in the next elections, probably in the following years, and we keep having these discussions, then that's going to say something about Latin American democracies. And it's that we are ready to finally present and get away from the dependence of the person that's sitting in the president's chair. What I want to mean with this is if as a country, Colombia, and as a continent or subcontinent, Latin America finally gets to the point where it doesn't matter who sits on the president's chair in each country, because there's going to be a state politics, then it's going to be a good thing. I'm not sure we're, we're there yet. I hope that's the case, because if that's the case, then that means Colombia has, grow, has grown and changed over these 20 years and is ready to accept different political perspectives without affecting the political and the state politics, you know, to, to know where we're going, to aim for something independently from which political perspective you come from. Now, if you ask me what happens between Brazil and Colombia, what are the similarities? I'm going to tell you what I believe is the biggest problem in Latin America is lack of access to opportunities. If you see Brazil and Colombia in their electoral maps, it's just a matter of understanding what happens in each region and it's going to be the same issue. If you go to the south of Brazil, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Curitiba, all these places, they have huge development uh, indexes, access to, your, to opportunities, they cover every basic need. If you go to the north of Brazil, it's going to be a completely different country, and it's exactly what happens here. If you're in the nuclei of development, it's going to be fine. You're going to have access to your opportunity. There's poverty, of course, we have to work on that. But it's a radical difference between the points of the country that are hugely developed and the ones that are not. And I think that's precisely what causes that these speeches are sold in the electors of, in, you know, in Latin American electors. Uh, the purple uh, represents uh, the, the, the Petro uh, community, Petro voters, and, and the um, yellow and um, uh, the yellow colors uh, represent uh, the Hernandez community and the Petro community won. Um, so does this map, you know, uh, does it work similar to the way the U.S. map works now, where you have red and blue states, where you have divisiveness, uh, where you have, a, a, you know, a comp you have two countries uh, operating within the country? Um, is, is that is that a, a dark possibility for Colombia? Because it's happening in the U.S. for sure. You get to television, you know what I mean. Um, we have huge divisiveness. Aside from disparity, we have that too. Um, but you know, we're not we're not heading anywhere good. And so the question is whether the, the you know the the you know the the phenomenon is similar in in the U.S. and in Colombia and maybe other countries also in, in Latin America. Yes, I mean Colombia has a long history of polarization. It's been two hundred years of civil and political conflict that we have resolved bit by bit. <laughs> every now and then. But yes, Jay, the answer is it's totally correct. The difference is that here in Colombia, you don't get a uniformity within the states, but rather a, major, a, a slight majority 
inside each of the states. If you, if you go or the departments that are the political divisions here in Colombia, if you go and check on the departments, it depends where you are. So you have a place like Antioquia, which is like the stronghold of the right of Colombia, where Álvaro Uribe Vélez is from. That's going to be a, a department that's always going to support the rightist parties in Colombia, right? But if you see just to the left of Antioquia, you have Choco, which is the place that is the most dark purple in the map, is one of is one of the poorest departments in Colombia. So yes, we're we're living that. It happens even between departments and between and inside departments inside cities. You can see how the electorate is divided depending on their access to opportunities and the development indexes. Um, in which every elector lives. It, that does not mean that someone that has access to opportunities, that has been a privileged person, is not going to vote for Gustavo Petro, Rol Fernandez. I mean, there's everything, a little bit of everything in each political camp, let's call it. But certainly we have polarization, and we have polarization between the people that believe that something was being done properly in the past 20 years and the ones that don't. And I say this in such a general way because. If you ask most of the Colombians, they do not like the candidates. <laughs> they just have to choose between what what's less worse or what they consider is not that bad. Well, we have we have a different kind of thing. We have ideological divisions. I'm sure you've seen all our ideological divisions on, for example, abortion, uh, gun control, um, you know, same-sex marriage. Uh, uh, so many things we are divided, and we are divided in the in in that same kind of you know two country division. And I and I wonder if you are experiencing the same thing in Colombia, uh, whether the division that we talk about is not it's not a perfect division, but it is a, an identifiable one. Is also on ideological grounds. I, I do believe it's on ideological grounds and, and it's on ideological grounds relating to how the country is developing and the mechanisms through which it's it has been developing. So if we go to social rights, Colombia is a conservative country historically. So you're gonna see that division straightforward. So young people is prone to more liberal, liberal ideas regarding social rights, and uh, individual rights. Older people might not be too fond of those ideas, right? But if you ask me, I would say the biggest division in Colombia would be the the persons that supported how things were were being run and the ones that don't. Because well, in it's the middle, it's government operation, government efficiency, as you said, uh, uh, economic advantage rather than um, sort of religious motivation. Um, I mean, or, or, or ideological. And, and I'm sorry if, if, if I'm getting into like a lot of gray areas here, but I do believe that's the case because there's not a single answer. So many people, for example, support right, right uh, political parties because of religious ideas. It happens here in Colombia too. There's a couple of congressmen that have been elected by Christian bases and evangelical ones but it's not as influential as in the US. Hmm. You have- Let me go to one more, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, what I'm trying to explain is that political divisions in Colombia are really diverse and you get a little bit of everything. If you go to persons to, that supported Gustavo Petro, you're gonna find from the person that is part of the Colombian Communist Party that firmly believes that the rebels have been fighting for a just cause for 60 years to a person that might be in the center of the political spectrum that believes that the governments of the last 20 years have not addressed properly social issues, but they prefer change instead of keeping of keep doing the same in fear than something more radical from the left comes to the country. And if you go to the right, it's the same. So you have people that firmly believe that the extreme right is the answer that we have to keep on fighting the guerrillas and the drug on wars just with weapons and bullets. And then you have people that are a little bit more prone to the center, which I consider myself. I mean, I think I'm in the right political spectrum, but I do believe that if we want to change violence, we have to address the drug, the war on drugs from a social perspective. If we want to change 
the lack of opportunities, we have to work on the social issues of the country by doing it with the private sector. I do not believe the public sector is going to be is going to be the answer and is going to be the most efficient way of solving things. So with that being said, is there's a huge gray area even between the camps and the two political sites that were in the election in Colombia. It's it's such a, 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 a diverse thing. And one thing they do have in common is they want the best for Colombia, of course, just as in the state, both in the states, both sides of the discussion wants the best for the states. But um, yeah, that ha that's how it goes. It, it's crazy because you get people from a religious background that vote for the left and people from a re religious background that vote for the right. So there's not like a clear consensus. No, but, but, rather... but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if other countries in Latin America have the same kind of division, the same kind of like grayscale um, division where uh, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to find a hard boundary. Um, uh, it, Brazil is like that, or maybe Venezuela. I don't know. You tell me, tell me what the the general direction is for Latin America on this particular um, issue. Yeah. So, if I, I believe there's two discussions. The first one is the economic one, and because of the influence of the socialism of the 21st century that you, Hugo Chavez campaigned all along Latin America. There's a huge discussion in Latin America between what leftists called neoliberalism and then a more central and plant economy perspective. So that's one big difference. You can put whatever kind of social perspective or angles you have there. So either you believe that private enterprises and working with the private sector works and has worked or you don't. And you believe that is a state that has to plan, that has to be a more centralized economy such as the one that was promoted by those ideals, right? So I think that's the first division. And then you have the second one, which is a cultural one. And it goes in a way in the discussion with individual and social rights. So that's two different things because you get people that support abortion in Colombia that are from the right and are from the left. And then you get people that do not support abortion that are from the left and from the right. So it's it's quite different and most of Latin America works this way. And I think this happens because of the different perspectives and opportunities people have. If you ask myself, I do believe a liberal economy is the way to keep on building the country such as we have done in the past 20 years. But I do believe that social policies and individual rights are hugely important, especially in Colombia, the right to abortion is one of the ways to escape the poverty traps. Colombia and most of Latin America is not like the states where you can have a minimum wage job and you can get a car, you can get a house, you can survive, right? Here, if you get two childs, if, you, if you're a woman, you get pregnant and you have two children, chances are you and your next 10 generations are gonna be poor. So social rights have a huge impact in, in economic development. So with all this being said, and sorry, Jay, I know I usually talk a lot. Is what I no, want to I, say you're is you're very passionate about it, and I <clears throat> and I and I sense in you um, um, a very strong feeling to do what you can do uh, for the benefit of Colombia um, and to make it a better place. But it may not it may not work out the way you want. Huh? I'm sorry to tell you, it's, it, it may not true. be a perfect result. So my question to you. Here you are, you've been thoughtful and passionate about it. You're fully informed about it. You think about it. And I know this not only from discussion today, but every time we have talked. Um, and the question is, what are you doing in order to move Colombia in the right direction? So I believe in work, Jay. Uh, I believe that hard work, toil and grinding, it's, it's the answer. I believe building companies, and giving employment is the most social action you can take in your life. I do not believe the state has to answer for those things. I think the state has to cover the basic things that every human person needs to decide what to do with his life. But honestly, just work, Jay. I'm, I'm an optimistic person, is what I tell you. I, I am not fond of the government right now. I am not fond of the ideas they have. That doesn't mean I'm gonna run away from Colombia in one or two years. I wanna keep building this country. And I would like to have 
that silver lining that I told you. Hopefully we do not depend so much on the person that's sitting on the presidency. And what am I doing? Working, trying to close deals, getting new clients and telling them that Colombia is now a stable country, that despite the elections, our institutions have changed this past 20 years. And hopefully that's gonna, that's gonna keep us going on track, you know? And, and the reflection I was doing after the election was if we managed to survive through almost 70 years of a bloodbath between the guerrillas and the army, and then we got the drug cartels, and then we have the FARC, we can survive four years of a bad government. <laughs> so I don't think it's that bad. I believe Colombians are, are really prone to hard work, are, are people that likes to earn things, not to be given to them. And uh, yes, what am I doing? Working, believing in my country, and hopefully, hopefully there's that silver lining. And in four years, we get to elect a better president as a show of what's Latin America's oldest democracy, which is Colombia, is right. Are you uh, unique, or <laughs> do you know a lot of people who feel the same way you do? So I come from a business context. You know, my dad was also a businessman. Most of my of the people I move around are business persons that are working for the country. So they feel the same. They think until they are not giving enough evidence that their freedom and their things are not going to go south, they are gonna keep on building Colombia. Because honestly, Jay, we've been through worst. <laughs> now, let me ask you this too. We live in a world where borders are porous. <clears throat> we live in a world where uh, Vladimir Putin can and does affect uh, American elections, and he's done that um, twice already, and he's probably going to do it again. Uh, we live in a world where Russia and China are taking advantage of, um, you know, developing countries in Africa. Uh, Putin is selling his war in a variety of places in Africa, uh, and likewise uh, in Latin America. And I wonder if this is happening in Colombia or any of the countries we've mentioned that you know about, um, and and whether you have any concern that um, you know that Russia, China, or anyone else could come in and skew the process that you're talking about. We've been talking about mostly domestic affairs in yeah. Colombia. Uh, are you concerned that foreign nations whose um, scruples, whose intentions are questionable are coming into Latin America, coming into Colombia, and may affect the politics? I hope not. I mean, as, as we discussed earlier, Colombia is, if not the most important ally of the US in South America, Colombia is really close to NATO. We have been working with this organization to standardize our military forces since 10 years ago, especially because of our internal conflict, but this has an interest of the Colombian diplomacy to get linked to those experiences and to understand how those military how those military forces work in an international context. So my first answer is I hope not. The real answer is I think they do influence Latin America in a certain way, not Colombia because of what I just told you, but it's clear that Russia has an agenda, an international one to sell its clearly it, its aggression to, to Ukraine. And how can it affect Latin America? I mean, I hope we don't get to the point to something similar like the 60s, where we had missiles pointing to the US from Cuba and causing a huge alarm in the world. But I think that's a probability. Putin is cornered. I firmly believe he's not going to win that war. It's Wars are not just fought with soldiers on the ground and equipment, but with money and logistics. And if you ask me who's got most money and logistics, I'm going to bet on NATO a hundred times more than I, than, than I would bet in Russia and Ukraine. But I do believe this is going to have consequences in the region. Russia has been really close to Nicaragua, which is a country that does not have the best relations with Colombia. Russia has been really close with Nicolás Maduro's government in Venezuela. A couple of years ago, a couple of bombers from Russia flew pass through Colombian airspace, which were intercepted by our Air Force. But it certainly raises concerns, specifically because Latin America has been a peaceful continent regarding 
you know, international relations, although there's been a couple of historical wars, Latin American countries are not prone, not used to fight each other. It's not, it's simply not in our, in our agendas, right? So my concern is that this campaign and the fact that Russia is being cornered in Ukraine might bring some of those preoccupations to the continent, a peaceful one, at least between countries. So hopefully it doesn't. I do believe that Latin America, whether I like it or not, is controlled by the US in a, from a security perspective. I rather have that than having Chinese and Russian interventions in Nicaragua or Russia, in Nicaragua, Venezuela or Cuba, messing the neighborhood around, you know? Part of the, part of the things that permits Latin America to focus on social and development issues is the fact that we have this Pax Americana that doesn't let any of these international things hit us, right? I mean, it, it, it's not something I'm proud to recognize, believe me, <laughs> but uh, it's true. And uh, I do not like Russian bombers flying over Colombia. I do not like Russian ships being stationed in Nicaragua. I think it's a threat to the region. And it certainly diverges us from where we have to focus. Because once Latin American countries get involved in these international controversies that hit us, but really we're not that close to those conflicts, right? So our focus of working on building socially our countries, advancing our economies, our infrastructure is going to change to an international conflict that has nothing to do with us. And that is simply, we are just being used like pawns in a, in a chessboard. So hopefully it doesn't happen. I hope not. Hope not. Well, Juan Pablo Otello, it's really wonderful to talk to you again. Uh, we are for sure out of time, um, but I have greatly learned from this discussion and I hope we can circle back and talk some more. Um, uh, you know, maybe Nicholas Sussman will let me talk to you again. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. I mean, I'm available, Jay. I love talking to you guys. I think it's important that we build communication between the North and the South of the continent, especially in these times where we have such dramatic and tyrannic speeches being repeated all over the world. For me, it's a tragedy. I just can't understand how these things still happen, but well. That's what dictators and autocrats cost, right? <laughs> uh, thank you, Juan. It's wonderful to talk to you. Next time was, soon. It was a pleasure, Jay. Thanks a lot for having me again. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.